going to start our pump service. It will be working on the old hymnal, seeing some old papers that we'll expect on Father's Day. Um, um, so you'll turn to hymn number 29. This is my Father's World. We will sing all three verses. And if you could stand with me on this, we've got a couple that are kind of short. So we'll stand and worship and pray and give honor to our Father to this morning. He has not treated us as we deserve, 
for our sins, or paid us back for our wrongs. As high as the heavens are above the earth, that is how vast his mercy is towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, that is how far he has removed our rebellious acts from himself. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. And at the reading of God's word, all his people said, Amen. It is the truth. So, so good. Um, let's do this this morning. A couple of things that I want to do is make sure that we uh, recognize an opportunity for uh, prayer requests and congregational prayer. And I have a few items that were kind of forwarded along to me even this morning. Um, let me ask this first, though. Do we have anybody who celebrated this week? Anybody have a birthday or an anniversary that you celebrated that we can celebrate with you and drag you up front to these uh, birthdays and anniversaries? All right. If not, a um, couple of prayer requests that are really important. Uh, you'd be thinking of ones to share with me as well, and we'll get those written down here also. Um, let me just say this. One of the really neat things about Thursday, if you ever get a chance to join us at Nancy Godby's house for a prayer meeting on Thursday, these things get covered in great detail, and she has a pretty long prayer list that she keeps uh, all the things that get mentioned at some point. And so you can rest assured, either congregationally in a corporate sense you were prayed for, or specifically if you've mentioned something and we just know that you know you consider prayer to be important, uh, which it is obviously, but we will make sure to pray for you on Thursdays. Um, so anyway, think on that. And uh, let me ask this morning, did we have any uh, prayer requests that we can mention this morning or any praise reports that we would share with the congregation? I'll share a couple of needs with you. Ones you want to remember this morning. Uh, Alan Thompson goes to the doctor's office this week uh, to get a report back from some recent testing that he had. And Martha wanted to make sure we please keep him in mind as well. Um, his brother, Tim, um, was in a horrible farming accident with a, uh, with a, uh, what do they call it, a larger bush hog. Bush hog. Thank you. He was, they were trying to adjust the bush hog and one set of, side of it let go. And the entire um, kind of bat wing style that comes down, came down and smashed his leg, knee, all of that. And so they could not even get him out from underneath the tractor for a while until emergency services got there. So they asked that we please pray for them because they're dealing with a real bad situation with that. Um, also, Kathy Carmen, uh, she's really great about us uh, having opportunities at Campbellsville University to come and speak on the second uh, Monday of each month. Her brother was in a really horrible car accident this week on Tuesday, she said, and uh, he has, as of yesterday, she wrote me, that he has taken a trip to the force. So would you please keep her in prayer? I told her we'd mention her family and her brother specifically. So Tim Thompson, and then also uh, her brother as well, and his name is Paul. Um, anybody else? All right. Let's go ahead and we'll do this. I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to we're going to get a chance to see something that's going to have a little bit tongue-in-cheek with Father's Day, and it's pretty funny if you get a chance to see that. It'll give some new people to have a chance to share this morning. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, we are indeed in debt to you. For the scriptures that we read and what we sing about this morning are proof of your great grace and your mercy to us, how much you love us, that you would forgive us and not count our wrongs us that you are indeed always ready to forgive. Father, may we be fast, may we be fast to turn our hearts to you. Lord God, we bring before you the names of people that we care about that are struggling with illness, that have had uh, horrible accidents in this past week, uh, folks that would just absolutely thrive to get some good news. And so for the prayer requests that we mentioned, Lord God, we lift them up to you knowing that you do as you tell us in the book of Romans, you do all of these things for the good of those who love you. So, Father, we pray for your spirit to do it. We know you do what is right. Help us also to be content and convicted, but to trust you in these matters of prayer is doing what needs to be done. And so, Father, we will wait on you and we will trust in your time and your will. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Gentlemen, mm -hmm. gentlemen. Welcome to another scab. How's anybody? I mean anybody at all. 
Who defeats our champion? Would you hold the box for me just at the back? Would you hold this where people can get these when they go out? 
So we have a Happy Father's Day bag for you, and good things come in small packages, right? What's inside of this, apart from the little uh, tissue and stuff in there as well, is we have, for our dads, we have, now this is, you can't think of dads as, you know, awesome without the idea of strength, right? Your dad may be strong, conviction strong physically, but we have uh, bought for and have donated free day passes. This is like giving a woman a vacuum cleaner, right, for her birthday. We have got free day passes for dad plus one at Freedom Fitness Gym. So that's, that's a free trip in, and we give every person in the bag, there's going to be two of these. So you can take with you a spouse. You can take with you a son or a daughter. You can take a good friend. Or if you're like, you know what, I'm really not going to be able to get into the gym and hammer that out, then what you do is you give them away and let them be a blessing to somebody else as well. What's really cool is on the back, we take two quarters, and anybody knows Luke in the gym, two quarters will buy you what? You get a water at the gym, right? We don't have a water fountain there, but uh, if you ever want to come in and I can get you signed up and get you into where you don't have to spend a dime on anything, just the paperwork, I'm there on Tuesdays and I'm there on Thursdays, but I would love to encourage you. I would love to cheer you on and champion you because you, we know in the difficult times, you, like mom, you have been there to champion us and to be strong for us when we needed you to be so. So we love you. We're going to have a word of prayer, just saying thanks for our dads, and then we will do this. Let me go ahead, and I'm going to give the girls this right now. And when it comes to the end of our service, I'll let them come out first. Those lovely ladies will help us out. Let's have a word of prayer and give thanks for that. Father, we just say that word. And it means everything to us that you are, as Jesus said, even on the cross, Father, Father, you are our dad. Yes, you are Lord, and yes, we fear you, but God, we respect you, and more importantly, Lord, we love you. So this morning on this day, as we think about our dads, we remember how you have been loving and kind to us as a father is with a child. And we're thankful for our fathers, that they have maybe been that way for us to be here, to help take some of the pain into themselves so that maybe we didn't have to suffer as well. And so God, we lift them up and give you thanks because any father who is being a good father is simply reflecting you as the great I am, the only single father there is to mom. Lord, we thank you for a time like this today. We pray all this in Christ's name. Let's do a couple of more songs ready for our time of God's words today. We're still working out the old hymnal, hymn number 638, Faith of Our Fathers, we'll do all three verses. <laughs>
verses 1, 2, and 4. Listen to this. 
in Samaria and in the north. So Jehu wrote letters. Okay, now this is the one that God had told that he was going, that Elijah, when he was in that cave last week, that he was going to anoint him as a king and that he was going to bring judgment on the house of Ahab, all right? So it says, listen, it says, So Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria, to the rulers of the city, to the elders and to the guardians of the sons of Ahab, saying, listen to what he writes. He says, Now then, as soon as this letter comes to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, remember, 70 sons, his sons are with you, and there are with you chariots and horses and fortified cities and weapons, with all of that, select the best and the fittest of your master's son, sons and set him on his father's throne to fight your master for your master's house. Now, I want to tell you something. He was really good at the idea of psychological warfare. They had already seen him busy at work of beginning to cut down by execution all of these followers of Baal. He had already made sure that happened to Jezebel. And so when he says to them, you guys are holed up in your fort. You've got big walls to surround you. He said you've got horses and you've got chariots. Certainly all you need to do is just go ahead and point one of the sons to sit on that throne and all will be good. Will you do that? And they knew. They knew that he was not to be messed with. Listen to their response. But they were exceedingly afraid. All right? He's just one man, right? Not hardly. Not with the authority of God. He said, they wrote him and said, Behold, the two kings could not stand before him. That, term, that speaks of Ahab's children, Joram in the northern kingdom of Israel, and Ahaziah is the king of Judah. He had killed both of them. He had executed them. All right? Now listen to this. How then can we stand? If he's destroyed two kings, how can we stand? So he who was won over the palace, he who was over the city, together with the elders and the guardians, sent to Jehu, saying... We are your servants, and we will do all that you tell us. We will not make anyone king. Do whatever is good in your eyes. Now, if you've read this, you'll know that when you let Jehu off a leash like this, it is dangerous to those who are around him if you are unfaithful. Listen to this. Then Jehu wrote back to them a second letter saying, If you are on my side and if you are ready to obey me, take the heads of your master's sons and come to me at Jezreel tomorrow at this time. Now the king's sons, 70 persons, were there with the great men of the city who were bringing them up. And as soon as the letter came to them, they took the king's sons and slaughtered them. 70 persons put their heads in baskets and sent them to him at Jezreel. When the messenger came and told him they had brought the heads of the king's son, he said, lay them in two heaps at the entrance of the gate until morning. And then in the morning, when he went out and stood and he said to the people, he said, you are innocent. Jehu says, it was I, Jehu said, it was I who conspired against my master and killed him. But who struck down all of these? Now he makes them complicit. You see what he's done? He's made them complicit in this act. He said, now, he said, know then that you have killed them. But those who struck down these, he said, know that there shall fall to the earth nothing of the word of God, which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord has done what he said by his servant Elijah. And so Jehu struck down all who remained in the house of Ahab and Jezreel. All of his great men and all of his close friends and all of his priests until he left none remaining. Then he sent out and went to Samaria. And on the way, when he was at Beth Hakad amongst the shepherds, Jehu met the relatives of Ahaziah, who was the king of Judah at this time. And he said, Who are you? And they answered, We are relatives of Ahab, Ahaziah, and we have come down to visit the royal princes and the sons of the queen mother. And so what's happening? Notice this. In a day where they did not have Snapchat, they didn't have Instagram, they couldn't text mail it, you know, text message anybody, they had no idea, having set out from the south, that they were going to honor and pay homage to whoever would be the next son to ride the throne in the north in the name of Ahab. Not God. But Ahab. And because they were about to throw their allegiance behind that union, listen to what Jehu does. He says, he says, and Jehu said, take, take them alive. And they took them alive, but then they slaughtered them in the pit of Beth Akab. Forty-two persons. And he spared none of them. Them. And when he departed from there, he met Jehonadab, the son of Rechab. If you read about the Rechabites in the Bible, you have a connection to Moses back there of faithfulness. And so he says here. 
It says, And he departed from there and met Jonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he greeted him. He said, Is your heart true to my heart as mine is to yours? And Jehonadab answered, It is, Jacob said. And if it is, then give me your hand. And so he gave him his hand. And Jacob took him up with him into the chariot and said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. And so he had him ride in his chariot. And when he came to Samaria, he struck down all who remained to, true to Ahab in Samaria until he had wiped them all out. According, listen to this, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah. Now, man, I'm going to tell you, that is hardcore. That passage that we've read, it's not even the whole chapter, okay? If you read just that first part, just ten verses of that, you look in this and you probably think, I never read about that in the Bible. There's no little Bible picture storybooks that has chapter 10 in there. You know, no, no coloring pages for those kind of things. It's, unless you have one singular red magic marker, okay? That would be all you could do. And it gets worse. You know what Jehu does next? Jehu then, he calls to all the people, and he's going to purge this problem of worshiping Baal, which is what the Israelites had gotten into. They had started worshiping Baal of the Canaanites, and he tells them, he says, you know what? He says, Ahab worshiped, he said, he worshipped Baal a little bit. I'm going to worship him more. You see that in the next verses? He throws down something that's bound to get everyone, everyone's attention. And he says, come into Jerusalem. He says, if you're a prophet of Baal, come to Jerusalem and go to the temple. And we are going to perform a sacrifice there. And all these guys show up. They're excited. They're like, all right, we're done with having to deal with this whole Hebrew issue of the southern kingdom and their righteousness and all. And they show up. And the Bible tells us that his plan, Jehu's plan, was to have 80 men that were around the temple of Baal. And his words to them were, you are to go in and cut down everyone inside that temple. Cut them down. Put them to death. And if anyone leaves and runs out of this temple, you are to put them to death. If you do not, your life is forfeit. And so that's 80, perhaps. If you assume there might be to a man, 80 people inside of the temple, I was doing some lazy math. On this. I was trying to figure it out. I was thinking, okay, we got 70, and then we got 42, and then we've got this other here. That's just at a bare minimum, right at around 200 people that were put to death by him already. But it goes on to tell us in this passage over and over, it tells us that he killed supporters and those who were in charge of the government while there was all of the kingdom of Ahab was going on. And so he ends up cutting down people in the extreme. Jehu, roughly 193, household of Ahab, zero. God is cleaning house amongst even his people. And that's a crazy and a grisly theme in the history of Israel. And there's a reason that we swam in this bloodbath of a passage this morning. All right? Here's the reason. These are the things that are the takeaway for us from what we've read and what was said last week when we were talking about Elijah having gotten into a great depression while he had been serving God faithfully, and yet he feared for his life. The takeaway is this. Number one, that sin will be judged. Right? This is good. Really, it's a short message beyond the text. Sin will be judged, and number two, God's word will be fulfilled. Sin will be judged, and God's word will be fulfilled. When you look at what God was willing to do to try to bring his people through and, and safe and pure, it shows that God is radical in regard to sin. You remember that when Jesus is talking in the Sermon on the Mount? He says, look, he says, if your eye causes you to sin, what do we know? Yeah, you pluck it out because it's better, right? Better to go blind in one eye into eternity than it would be to go with both eyes and end up in hell. Okay? So God is willing and the hand is used as an illustration of that as well. And so we look at this kind of radical approach to cleansing the sin within an entire nation, and we look at those leaders, and you might be saying to yourself, well, Marty, why did God have to be so hard on them? Why so intense? I mean, this passage here is something that's not flowery in any way, shape, or form. And I look at that, and I think, well, this is, this is the problem, that those leaders had turned the people of Israel, and they had turned them into idol, idol worshipers to the point that they had corrupted them, and they had destroyed especially the nation of Israel, the kingdom in the north. Judah is what they refer to in the south. And I look at that and I think, you know, that is the reason we have to be very careful when it comes to our leaders, not only in the church, not only in our community, but in the world. We need to be very careful. 
careful with our leaders to be prayerful and spiritual about any time you have an opportunity to cast a vote. Amen? Spiritual and have a God-centered focus if we do so. And just like Israel, and I'm speaking of Israel as a nation, God had a special work for his people to do because they had fallen into such a grievous sin of idolatry. They were in the they were unfaithful to God. And God has special work for us to do as well. You know what the special work God has for you to do is? That special work is for you to be a disciple. It means a follower of Jesus, right? You are meant, all you are meant to do in the larger sense of things is to glorify God by being a disciple who makes disciples of Jesus. And so that's what the focus is going to be. That's the kind of thing that we're going to drive home. We're still doing with the Word, and it's going to be amazing to see where God brings us each week. But one of the things that we're going to do is on Wednesday night, we finished that whole series from Francis Chan where we were talking about unity. And it was a great challenge to us to think about the fact that a lot of times we are just fine to be divided. But you know what? We honor God when we're brought back together. And the thing that happens is with Israel in the north and Judah in the south, God's great hope would have been that they would have come back together. But sin is going to be sin and the kingdom of the north continued to pursue that. And the people in the south would be faithful to a point. You have both Judah and you have Benjamin, two tribes that were left in the southern kingdom. And they were righteous to a point, at least until they became very self-righteous. But Jesus says, you know what? That purpose of preparing people for the Jews to be ready for the Messiah who would come, we have an opportunity knowing that Jesus has come for us to prepare other people to meet God in eternity. And so Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the very age, until the very end of the age. Now that's the great commission. Those are the dying words of Jesus. And his call to us is to be disciples and be disciple makers. And so I want to challenge you that what we're doing and what we're talking about on Wednesday night is an attempt to do two things. One, we just want to follow the word of God and what Jesus has challenged us to do. But also to build that revival of our own membership that when we would have Wednesday nights, there were times where we were close to this number. And that if we can be there together for us to be together in the word of God, I absolutely understand if you find yourself because of health and ability to get here or drive or anything like that. Totally understand that. But there is a, there's an opportunity and there is a spirit that happens. We, we found that Wednesday night. We stayed till like 7.20, 20 minutes after the hour, because there was an enthusiasm about what we were talking about in regarding to not only what we had been speaking of, but what we were thinking about heading as individuals and with our heart as a congregation as well. All of that was just because we wanted to be more unified. Now, Dad's is his Father's Day, and so here's the connection, all right? I want you to note something that in the text stands out in the reading. Did you notice, like, David's household, King David? We remember King David. David is referred to as a man after God's own heart, right? We know he had the whole Bathsheba episode, and we know that he had a tendency to play favorites with his sons to the point that that ended up being problematic. But overwhelmingly, he was a man after God's own heart. Do you know who was David's son? David's son was Solomon, and he was known for his incredible what? He was, yeah, he was known for his wisdom, right? And so you have father and son, but during that time of transition from David, who was a man after God's own heart, going to Solomon as the wisest man ever, Solomon had a woman problem, if you will, to the point where he had, what, 700 wives and 300 concubines, political alliances that were being made. Ahab was small potatoes with only seven sons based out of those kind of alliances. When we look at what we see there, and we realized that there was an idolatry that started, idolatry, worshiping idols, literally worshiping idols, started happening under Solomon's reign. Did you catch that? Have you seen that? And that's where our reading has been within the last month. And you see a king who was so wise like Solomon, but yet he was willing to turn over his convictions and his wisdom and worship the idols that his wives brought in to the king. That's exactly what the Bible says. It says that 
with all the foreign wives that he had, and so came foreign religions, and so came foreign ideas. Now Rehoboam was the son, you have David, you have Solomon, and you have Rehoboam. Rehoboam is the son that after Solomon died, the people fled. The people fled for a burden to be given, that they might finally stop being taxed so heavily and yet Rehoboam took some stupid counsel from some very young counselors who said, you know what you ought to do with the people complaining? You ought to tell them that my dad may have been bad and I'm worse. And he came out and he did that and split the nation completely into two. Ten tribes in the north, all of those referred to us by us in the, in the Bible as Israel, or in the New Testament, you're familiar with the word Samaria. They ended up breaking away, and then only the two the remaining tribes of Judah and Benjamin stayed faithful. Rehoboam acted the fool and split the kingdom. But that's happened in the household of Asa. That brings us up to where we are today. Asa was a very good king in Judah in the south. Jehoshaphat was a mostly good king. The Bible says if you read about the kings and you're going through 1st and 2nd Kings and you're going through 1st and 2nd Samuel, you will constantly get this thing where they say, and Asa did what was good in the eyes of the Lord. But then when you get to Jehoshaphat, they'll say, Jehoshaphat did what was good in the eyes of the Lord except for... And then you get the parenthetical statement that kind of lets you know where they broke down. And then you get to this whole thing of Jehu. Jehu, do you know what his sin was? Now, up to this point, he has been on this slaughtering spree by the will of God to purge all of the sin that Ahab had created in that nation. But you know what his sin was? If you, if you got a chance to read chapter 10, he fell into the worship of the golden idols, the golden calf idols that were established in Dan as well as Bethel. Now I'm not sure if you're familiar with what that is. Um, you remember that there was a golden calf that Aaron produced, right? Remember that when the Israelites got to Mount Sinai? And we know that story. But what a lot of us don't realize is when the kingdom split between the north and the south, there ended up being this matter of convenience where the Jeroboam, uh, who was an opponent to Rehoboam in the south, Jeroboam said to the people, they said, well, hey, we, we now are two nations. You don't like what they were willing to do to tax you more, so what we'll do is we will build you idols, golden calves, in Dan and Bethel. What they effectively did was they took all of the faithful priests at that time, they fired them and sent them back south, and they said, we'll anoint our own. We'll put our own men bought and paid for, right? We'll put them in their positions of power, and you don't have to go all the way up to, or down to Jerusalem. You know what you do? Just stay up here. You don't have to drive far, right? You don't have to worry about when you're going to get back. You can go to lunch right after you get done worship. It's not a big problem. And so the Israelites, those who stayed in the northern kingdom, they chose the simple life, and they chose not to reunite the kingdom that had been broken. thought about where we're at sometimes. And how if you're like me, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, alright? I won't put anything on you other than just to ask yourself a question. If there's an easy way, or if there's a path of least resistance, do we tend to take it? Because the northern kingdom did it. And God said they would have trouble after trouble because they did. They chose what was easiest and sacrifice never, never comes. And so when I think about what we see in Scripture, we keep seeing this repeated cycle of someone who loved the Lord with all their heart and mind and soul and strength, and then the next generation came. And they were good except for. And then you get to the last one where you realize they were no good at all. I think Jehu was trying to have his cake and eat it too. But you can't, you can't have it both ways. You remember what Jesus said? That no one can serve two masters. Either you will what? You'll love one and hate the other, or vice versa. And so we can't just play it safe, and we can't just be easy about it. If it would be a matter of conviction that we be together and gather and draw encouragement from one another and become even more zealous for the Lord by our hearts being moved, and like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, their statement after they had spent time with the risen Christ was what? Did our hearts not burn within us? I'll tell you, that's a really neat thing when you get a chance to be with somebody just out in public and you're talking to them and you have an opportunity to share.
share the mutual faith in Jesus and to share your excitement for Christ and what he'll do for us. So when you think of Joshua in the Old Testament, he was basically told this. You can't have it both ways. He said, choose this day whom you will serve. Right? And the challenge was, you can serve Baal. You can serve the gods of the people across the Jordan. And yet that was going to be the very thing that would condemn his people. It would be the very thing that would corrode the nation of Israel. Or, or you can serve the God, the God of the Israelites. You can serve this God of hope. So the call for us, from such a bloody beginning in what I shared, and trust me, I did you a favor. It gets worse when you read about the others that were wiped out in the temple. But we read that because two things are true. And that is, sin has its punishment. God's word will be true. And so I would say that ought to motivate us, terrify us, bring us to a place of great fear and respect in our relationship with God. And so this morning as we leave here, my prayer is that we will take our own heart and examine it and take ourselves down to that next level. Walk deeper in the faith of God. Father, what a disturbing passage of scripture and there are more and yet God when you show us things like that it's not just to be clever uh, Lord it's not just to share a scripture as a gimmick it is for us to pay attention to the lesson of those who have gone before us that we might be faithful faithful as fathers with our children faithful as mothers with our children faithful as those young people who grow up into another generation, that we would not drop the ball and become the second generation that begins to stray away from your word and love for you, God. That we would be those who serve you faithfully. Forgive us for the times where we have, Lord, we have given our heart to everything but you. When we have worshipped idols of time, things that we live by and our philosophies in our head, Lord, many times we have abandoned you in pursuit of something that we can do. Lord, may we be true to your word. May our wisdom come from you. And Lord, may that be handed down to the next generation and the next generation. May we be a people of great faith and faithfulness. faithfulness. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. We'll just do two verses of that hymn this morning. And um, it's 169. 169 is there's power in the blood. This song, this hymn, asks questions, hard questions, about our commitment to God, but there's power in the blood to guide us and direct us. So let's just do, um, let's do, I like one and two, because that whole freedom from sin is an awesome passage. Just verses one and two of 169. Remember when the old book completed this morning. Let's stand together.
Minister Jean Sheldon tells of the son born to Robert and Suzanne Massey. Their little boy was a normal baby in most respects. He had the correct number of fingers, toes, eyes, and ears. He was intelligent, probably brighter than usual, child. He cried, sucked, yowled, and wet his diaper just like other babies. Only one thing made Bobby Massey different. He was a hemophiliac, a bleeder. Little did Bobby's parents suspect, suspect how crushingly cruel that difference would be. The abuse they would suffer from doctors, the fear that caused schools to refuse to educate Bobby and made the couple's friends forbid their children to play with the boy. They were unaware of the astronomical cost of braces, wheelchairs, and similar equipment, and worst of all, the ceaseless, often fruitless, and almost bankruptcy, bankrupting search for blood. To supply plasma for their son's bleeding joints, the Masseys worked continually in blood drives. In Journey, which was their book written in 1975, they tell how Bobby's need for plasma soared as he grew up, rising from 39 transfusions in 1961 to 107 just six years later. Without the blood, Bobby's knees and elbows soon would become frozen and useless. So they badgered their friends and strangers for blood. Sometimes the masses became bitter, they admitted, such as when Red Cross officials let a major advance in hemophilia therapy go down the drain, or when drug companies, companies immorally price gouged them, and whenever fellow Americans seemed callous to the woes of hemophiliacs. But the masses also had reasons for Thanksgiving. There was a Russian friend of mine, Susie Massey wrote, who gave blood at Christmas because he said, that's all I have to give. Across the nations, thousands shared their blood. Bobby might not be alive today, so acknowledged, but for this unseen, unsolicited sense of brotherhood. Christians gathered at the Lord's table understand this feeling of gratitude, for we are tied together inseparably by an unsolicited gift of blood. On this Father's Day, we never fail to grasp and appreciate that we are blood relatives because Jesus' selfless love has transfused us. As we prepare to take our communion today, if you will, and open the packet that has the bread, on the evening when Jesus was betrayed and captured, at the Last Supper, he said to his disciples, he broke the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And after that, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sin.
things to let you know of while we're getting ready to have a closing word of prayer is uh, this upcoming week, um, it looks like things are in place already. Jonathan, you get deployed later this week, is that correct? And so you get deployed later this week, right? And so I'm thankful that I, I, I misunderstood that he had already been deployed earlier than what, he's, uh, what I thought. And so he'll be uh, heading out this week. So would you please keep Jonathan in your prayers? Would you keep them and his fellow platoon mates as well? May all of them be in our prayers, uh, especially so. Uh, we love you, Jonathan, and I'm comfortable saying that. Appreciate your heart very much, and so we'll keep you in prayer. Um, also, keep in mind, just uh, like you said, Alan, uh, and the results of his tests that are coming up this week. And he did say the other day when I was there with them, he said, please let people know, come by, say hello, see me. Uh, I'd love to spend time with you. So uh, keep that in mind. So, anything else to announce to the church body? There's no service tonight. It's Father's Day. Enjoy the rest of the day with your old dad, and uh, have a great time doing that, or in memory of the Father. But uh, any other announcements to make this morning, church? All right, let's have Lewis. I'll ask if he will close us out, and then as my dad, stop by the back and grab one of those gifts. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you.